Okay. Uh, my name is George Dunlap. I work for Citrix on the open source team. I'm a committer and I'm a maintainer, and I've actually been working on Zen for a number of years. So, and I'm going to talk about actually a little bit in answer to your question, um, some things that's going on in x86. Now, Zen has been on x86 for 15 years now, and whenever you have a project that has been going on for 15 years, at some point you kind of think, aren't you done yet? I mean, I understand you know, there's ARM and embedded and these things going on, but isn't, is there still actually anything going on in x86? And the answer is a resounding yes. We've actually had, as, as uh, Lars has said, the development of x86 has been accelerating. We've had more and more uh, submissions. So um, we've got a lot of stuff, interesting stuff going on on x86 and the cloud and, and things like that. And um, I could go point by point and talk about each one, but I think that would be uh, pretty boring. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about some things that we have done, some things that are recently finished, and those will be in green. I'm going to talk about some things that we're actively working on and should be available soon in the next couple of releases, and those are going to be in yellow. I'm going to talk about some, some cool ideas that we have, uh, things that we've thought about, some things that we think should work, but no one has committed to actually do yet. And of course, until you actually do it, you don't know if it's going to work. So um, those are going to be in, in blue. But instead of just having a list, I'm going to try and organize them into sort of themes. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a series of specific uh, features that uh, whether we have done or are developing. And then I'm going to talk about how those work together to make, to allow very interesting things to happen. Okay, so let's start with PBH. So if you guys have been following, if anyone's been following the Zen community for a while, you know that we've been talking about PBH for a long time. And the good news is, it is finally here. So we have full PBH DOM U support as of 4.10, which was six months ago and uh, Linux 4.15. We even have our first backwards compatibility hack, which is uh, proof that uh, this actually is finally supported. Um, we also have experimental PBH 12.0 support in uh, 4.11, and we fully expect to have full PBH 12.0 support in uh, 4.12. So PBH, what is it? It is a next generation pair virtualization <coughs> mode. So you may know that Zen has two uh, guest modes. One is PV mode, paravirtualized mode, which was written before the x86 um, uh, paravirtualization extensions were, were published. Uh, we also have HVM mode, which is for kind of legacy guest OSs, and also it has full emulation of motherboard and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and PVH is a mode which is designed to take the best parts of both PV and HVM. So it takes advantage of uh, pair virtualized uh, of, the, of the hardware virtualization support. Uh, and yet, at the same time, there's no need for an emulated BIOS or emulated devices. Um, it has better performance than PV. Uh, it should have a lower memory overhead than HVM. And it should have better security than either PV or HVM. So we're, we're really excited about this. So the next topic I want to talk about is kconfig. Now, you guys um, don't need to describe kconfig in detail. It's basically the same thing as in Linux. Uh, we actually, I think we actually just took the code from Linux and popped it into uh, Zen. I, I took it from port operation. Yeah. And, uh, and I updated the port. I was going to submit a series updated to the recent one. Right. So we even, we're keeping an update even with the, the developments inside of Linux uh, of, of kconfig. So, um, Go open source. So kconf for Zen, kconf, kconfig for Zen um, allows us users to produce smaller and more secure binaries. It also makes it easier for us as a as a community to accept experimental or partially complete uh, features because we don't have to. We can turn them off by default. We don't have to worry about affecting all of our users with including code which is uh, ex um, experimental and still being developed. Now. Because it's been added in quite late, there's a number of, we're slowly working in things which you can disable or enable or, or configure by kconfig. One of the things that we're working on doing is having a kconfig option to disable the PD mode entirely. 
PV mode has been there since the very beginning. So as you can imagine, its tendrils are kind of spread throughout the whole code base. So we're slowly moving things, all the specific PV code, into a separate section so that we can disable it. Um, that's, that's actively in development in, in the near future, we should be able to, uh, to, to do that. The next feature I want to talk about is, oh, this is very really dark, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> is PP Shin. Uh, so, as you may know, there are some older kernels, classic Zen kernels, which will, will only run in uh, Ring 1. They expect to run in PV mode. Um, and some older versions of distros, uh, RHEL 5, or older versions of Zusa, uh, have such kernels in them. So, they, uh, how do you support these kinds of systems? Well, the answer is uh, PV Shin. So, a shim is a build of Zen that is designed to allow uh, a, an unmodified classic PV guest to run in PVH mode. So, it's difficult to see here. So, that we have Zen at the bottom, we have a PVH guest, and inside of the PVH guest, we have another copy of Zen, a shim copy of Zen, which is designed specifically only to allow the PV only kernel to run in Ring 1. And because it's built from the exact same source code, it is bug for bug compatible with the, the, the hypervisor version of Zen, um, and it will continue to be going forward. And it's actually, it's quite easy to set up and use. So if you download 4.11 and just build it, then you will, um, by default, you'll get a shim built. And in your config, you just say type equals pbh, pb shim equals one, and you'll have a working pb shim system. And of course, what all these things together allow us to do is to build a cloud-ready you know, hypervisor that you can actually build a cloud from that has no PV support at all in it. Um, this means the code base is smaller, you have more savings. Um, it means the surface of attack is smaller, which means it's uh, better for security. Um, and uh, on top of that, but we're not kind of done yet, because there's another kind of cool idea that we haven't actually we haven't actually started implementing. No one has committed to implement yet, um, but we've been throwing it around for a while, and we think it's actually going to work. And that is running Windows in PVH mode. So we already have EFI support in PVH, and Windows running on EFI uh, versions of Windows which are capable of running EFI don't actually need direct support from uh, from the hardware, as far as we can tell. So the, the virtual EFI implementation already has, will already run in PVH mode. It already has support for the Zen PV disk and PV network. The only thing that is missing, as far as we can tell, for Windows is uh, some sort of a frame buffer. Uh, so Windows it, it wants to have graphics virtualization. It doesn't like having only a console. But we think that if we implement PV frame buffer support inside of, of EFI, it's possible that you'll be able to run Windows um, unmodified inside a PDH guest. And what that bothers you is one guest type to rule them all. You could, you could build a cloud or build a, a, a sort of consolidation system that only had a single type of guest, PDH. Um, and there's lots of advantages to, uh, to this sort of thing. Right, so if, if all your guests are QMU, uh, sorry, if all your guests are PDH, um, then you you won't have any you, you won't have any QMU device emulation. Yeah, you may you may use QMU for for backend depending on on how your system is set up. But, uh, right. So um, is PV mode obsolete then? Are we going to get rid of that? <laughs> well, talk about that. So uh, so we already have because of the PV shim the option to disable um, HVM entirely and run Zen in PV only mode. Now, to understand the next handful of um, uh, the the next handful of features, um, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, containers. So, uh, one of the things that you can do with containers that you can't do with Zen VMs at the moment is pass through host operating system primitives, right? So, typically with a container system, you have a host, a Linux container host, and you have a bunch of um, containers. The containers, um, the, the containers can direct, um, have mapped into them uh, Linux files. Um, in addition, you can also do things like um, binding host ports uh, to 
uh, things inside the container. So from the outside, um, it looks like you have uh, a single host IP address with multiple services running inside. Um, but inside, each of those services is running separ separated in their own uh, container. Now this has a bunch of advantages. Uh, for one thing, the file-based differences, um, it allows you to track the differences in the containers based on the files rather than on the blocks, which is a lot more um, efficient and effective. Um, it allows it, it makes it much easier from, from the, the host to be able to look inside the gas and see what's going on. Um, and it also makes it easy to set up, easier to set up multiple isolated services uh, without needing to actually mess around with a little internal private network and network forwarding and, and all this stuff. So, one of the features which has been implemented is um, PV non-PFS. So non-PFS is a way of sharing files uh, directly. And PV non-PFS, um, it's a normal Zen front end and back end. And what it allows you to do is to pass specific files from a host file system, or from the DOM0 file system, and expose them to the guests. Okay, so um, just like you can pass through files in containers. Um, the next version is something called PV calls. And uh, PV calls allows you to pass, to execute specific system calls from the, uh, pass them through from the, um, the guest onto DOM0. And the first, the, the system calls which have been implemented uh, already are specific to allowing you to bind the host ports. So we have socket, listen, accept, read, write, this sort of thing. And so what this allows you to do is to have host ports on DOM0 be exposed to, uh, to um, virtual machines. The next feature is Rocket Stage 1. And, and I'm told that actually this is slightly uh, um, a little bit obsolete now because CoreOS has, has deprecated Rocket. Um, but this, the basic idea is, is here. Um, so co uh, so CoreOS, um, the idea of, so Rocket used to be the, the part of CoreOS which would start uh, Linux containers. And stage one was the thing that actually set up your container to, to begin with. And it was just, it was implemented simply as, as a script. And you could implement your own scripts. And so Stefan wrote a proof of, proof of concept script that would allow you to have um, the rocket stage one, rather than um, starting a Linux container, that we'd use XL to create a, a Zen VM. Uh, so this would allow you to uh, run rocket containers um, using Zen VMs rather than Linux uh, containers. You put all these things together, and what you get is Zen being a full container host with all the advantages that you get from having containers with um, exposing ports and uh, the, the easy way you can uh, you know, clone the file systems and things like that. Um, but with the additional uh, isolation that you get from being able to run things in a virtual machine. And again, there's, there's uh, another interesting um, idea that we think uh, we've discussed and have think should be uh, possible to do. No one has actually started working on it yet, but it should be um, possible, which is, I'll call this hypervisor multiplexing, and I hope that you'll um, understand why, uh, why in a second. So one of the things that's already cool about Zen is that uh, Zen can run unmodified um, inside uh, the normal HVM style uh, virtual machine, right? So normally, if you're going to do nested, um, virtualization with most a lot of other hypervisors, you need to have support for nested HVM. Okay, so the so the uh, we have L0 which runs on the the bare hardware and L1 which runs inside the the, the gas. The L0 the L0 hypervisor needs to provide virtualized hardware virtualization support. A virtualized hardware virtualization support um, has <coughs> very complicated and it's been the source of a lot of, it's difficult to get right in a way that is um, uh, safe and not uh, um, a security issue. And so the result is that most cloud providers don't implement nested HVM support. But with Zen, you can have nested virtualization without nested HVM support. The only thing missing, however, is um, that such a, uh, such a, 
uh, nested VM can't take advantage of Zen. It, it, it does that because um, it's just working me to do. So, uh, so the Panopticon project, which is purple because we're so far we've talked about it, but not actually done anything to implement it yet. Um, the Panopticon idea is that Zen assumes that at any given point in time, any guests can read its own memory. Right. So the idea of the Panopticon was you build a prison where all the prisoners at any point in time think they don't know, they think that they may be being watched. And so the idea is Zen feels like at any given time, any guest can see what I can see. And so therefore, we're going to take all of the secrets outside of Zen. And then any future, um, I mean, so even as, if, if we get this thing implemented, then even as more and more spectra style attacks are um, uh, discovered, um, it won't matter to Zen as much because you, you, uh, the hypervisor um, won't have any information to leave. Okay, um, and with that, I think I will, that's all I have for now. I think with that, I think I'll take any questions. Uh, in the back. If you get shout it, I'll repeat the questions. Hello, Josh. Uh, I see you mentioned you can't complete in the slides. Right? Yeah. Uh, actually, I have been looking at this area about one year ago, and about one month ago, uh, about one month ago, Oh, okay. Right. About one month ago, I started to uh, dig into the key config of them, mm -hmm. and I found it is pretty out to date now. Um, and so, you mean the the code is out of date, or sorry, yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, okay. the code of key config, all code related to key config is in. And uh, okay, and so to, just to, to bring the answer to that question, um, uh, Doug has said that he's he's working on porting over the updates. So. Uh, yes, you mean you have planned to synchronize the two complete in Linux? Mm -hmm. Doug, Doug said that he'll do that, yeah. Oh, oh, right. yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I yes, I yeah, thank you. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Okay, so um, Doug says that he's going to, to pull in the changes up to 4.15. Uh, yeah, I see, thank you. When I get okay. Well, wait, when, he, when he gets out. Okay. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the run uh, Zen at a full container host. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I want to know, do you uh, have a release schedule about the, this feature? Um, we don't have a release schedule. Um, the, <coughs> I mean, it's a open source. It, you, tech, you need to have um, someone who is kind of driving. You need to have, usually it needs to be a company driving adoption of specific thing. Um, so uh, there is a company that has been working on this, um, uh, but it's not my company. <laughs> so do you want to say anything, Stefano? Or? Right. We'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow when the VRIA, in the VRIA presentation. Okay. okay, so there's a presentation tomorrow um, on VRIA OS uh, that Stefano will be giving. So, so it's been Stefano has been mainly working on a lot of these, uh, these features. So um, come to that presentation and you can ask that. Okay. okay. Uh, I also want to, uh, my second question. Maybe. Yeah. I want to know uh, the uh, Zen, uh, the Zen uh, run as a, a container host. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, compare the other container host like Docker. Uh, any feature? Uh, any mm -hmm. so feature? Yeah, yeah. Any feature? Uh, better, better uh, performance or other features about uh, this vision. Uh, yeah. well, I gave a presentation last year at Zen Summit and also yeah. earlier this year at TLC in Poland about this. Uh, so tomorrow I'm not going to go into this much detail. You might want to check the online YouTube video. But in short, uh, it works transparently. So the idea is that uh, all the same commands like Docker Run will, works exactly the same way. Yeah. The user experience is exactly the same. What changes is the runtime environment. So instead of getting Linux namespaces to run your application, you get a Zen VM. And as a consequence, you have different properties. 
usually, so the main one is a much stronger security environment. Uh, or real-time requirements if you are running on embedded. But the user experience is the same. Is the, is the runtime that changes? That uh, the, the idea. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the microphone there. Um, about this Panopticon idea, um, yeah. can you give a short um, like uh, idea of so what do you think the Zen hypervisor would actually have to see and what roadblocks would you see to, to implementing that? But I also see that there's a talk that has the keyword in the name, so maybe the short answer is wait until that talk. Yes, yeah, so if you want the details of that, I think um, yeah, that there's a waiting for the talk is. is all right. So, yeah. so you will give a bit more details about what yeah. you, what is okay. Yeah. So but the, the, the short we'll answer is design session okay. I see. We'll see. And, and there'll be a design session. But the, okay, the short answer is there's actually um, Zen doesn't actually need to know much specific things about the cat. So, yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing is, at the moment, um, occasionally, you know, for just just for hyper to, to read the hypercall um, thing. Uh, rather than mapping on mapping memory, it's just a little bit more efficient to to read it directly, and so um, and, and there's a lot of things like uh, yeah, there's various times that Zen needs to access memory. Um, so it, before Spectre, it's sort of like well, we've got how many terabytes of address space, just map it, right? There's no harm. There used to be no harm. Um, <laughs> well, there used to be, but we didn't know. Right. Oh yeah, that, that, that's right. We, we didn't know that there was any harm. Right? So now that we know there's a harm, it's actually um, so the conceptually it's actually quite simple because already um, for various reasons Zen can only have five terabytes of address of virtual address space um, due to is due to the limitations of the early x86 implementations. Um, so. Um, but Zen supports 16 terabytes of RAM. So Zen already has um, the functionality inside to map and unmap stuff um, that it doesn't. Uh, it's just, so if you have more than 5 terabytes of RAM, what happens is it maps around 5 terabytes um, all the time. And it maps and unmaps them uh, the, the extra stuff as it needs. So the, the stuff is built in on that automatically, right? So all we need to do is switch it so that like that 5 terabytes is 0. Right, so it sounds like technically it's probably not usually complicated. Well, okay. <laughs> conceptually it's not complicated. It turns out that um, when you actually start to look at it, there's a nice um, abstraction layer which isn't abstracted at all. Like it's got all kinds of backdoors and, and this kind of stuff. So to making it so that it actually works that way is going to be a little bit more difficult. But it's not, it's not conceptually difficult. And once we actually just figure out how to do it, then it should just work. Um, Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Great, thanks.